uh, they came out and they gave me all this paperwork for disability and fill this out. And I'm like, I, I'm like, no, get that away from me. Mm. I'm going home to work. That was the voice of owner operator Stephen Messick. Today headquartered in Addison, Illinois, and leased to nearby small fleet T Max Transportation with quite a special truck. Regular readers may well have read his story at overdriveonline.com a couple of weeks back now. Owner operator Steve Massett was our August Trucker of the Month, putting him in the running for our 2023 Trucker of the Year award that we've been counting down the months to this year with profiles of and podcasts with each of the individual owners or teams of owners, as it were. I'm Todd Dills and Massett in today's Overdrive Radio podcast for the week of September 10th, driving to the feed just a little late this week on Saturday, September 9th, and posting to the world-famous OverdriveOnline.com Monday, September 11th. Massett describes the teamwork he and his wife make of business. She handles much of the back office work while he runs the roads and, on the weekend, utilizes a purpose-built shop to maintain the late 1980s-built B-model cat engine in that special rig to hear a little bit more about later. Back office and other family support proves critical for the owner. As you heard up top, when he was just 18 years old, he was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. His life since then has been one of maintaining pain and complications day after day. He's 53 now though, and after decades of dump work with various Chicago construction outfits as an owner operator, what used to be his wintertime home at T-Max is now a year-round affair. Outbound from the region, he serves T-Max direct customers, often running spot market loads back. However, slim pickings have been for those returns of late. Unfortunately, right now with the economy, the, the loads are getting a little slimmer and a little cheaper, which yeah. you're almost to the point now where it's better to come back empty than it is to take the load. After the break, we'll pick right up with Massett, walking us through his early, early days trucking. Keep tuned for the big reveal, too. A toy turned daily driver that is his old school classic workhorse. Love your diesel? We get it. Protect your investment and maximize performance with Howe's Diesel Defender. Increase towing capacity, torque, and power. With Howe's, you'll hear the smooth rumble of a clean and well-lubricated engine in no time. Oh yeah, and Howe's Diesel Defender will increase your fuel economy by 5% or more. Guaranteed. Howe's Diesel Defender for every diesel. Find more about Defender at House. H-O-W-E-S, houseproducts.com. Here's Overdrive's August Trucker of the Month, owner-operator Steve Massett. Well, I started out uh, as a little kid, riding with Dad. My grandpa had a construction company, and uh, my dad would drive and also get the equipment. He learned early how to grease the trucks, check the oil, and a few years later would receive a little money for more advanced tasks. At three dollars a tire for every flat I fixed. <laughs> that was in like the early '80s. So um, he did that. Um, his his great my dad's great uncle had his own uh, he had a waste hauling business, hazardous waste and uh, chemicals. And uh, he would he was real good friend. Him and my dad he'd come down to the yard and uh, after work and they'd have a couple beers and talk and stuff. He always I guess he admired that I was working and going to the uh, eighth grade graduation. He asked me, he says, uh, come over here and work for me. I says, well, when do you want me to start? He goes, Monday. I said, okay. So the Monday after my eighth grade graduation, I started working for him. We worked almost seven days a week back then. So he had he had Max, worked on Max and all that stuff. At just 16, Massett got his class D chauffeur's license. So I started driving for him after school. I would uh, drive downtown with a cab over Mac F model, a 45 foot trailer, 16 years old. <clears throat> I drive downtown and pick up at the uh, at the hospitals downtown, all the red bag waste. Stuff. So I do that. I did that after school, from like three to ten o'clock every night. So all the way through high school, I did that. Uh, first summer out of high school, my dad says, "Well, if you're going to keep driving the truck, if you're not going to go to college." So let's go buy let's go buy your own truck and be an owner operator. That's what he was. So I'm okay. like, okay. So we bought it. I bought an old Mac. I was 88 when I bought my truck, 
And uh, I was 18 years old. I bought a 78 Mac uh, Venetti liner, 300 with a two stick six speed. Uh, we ended up rebuilding the cab, eating it, put a wet kit on it, and then uh, started uh, driving the first summer. The next spring after I got out of high school. So I was an operator doing that, hauling uh, gravel and dirt and stuff around Chicago. Okay. Um, I turned 21. The company owner that Massett was working for mostly at the time offered him a company driver job and he took it. Parking, but crucially not selling that 1978 Mac. Stick a pen in that. Took that job and uh, it lasted two years. The owner was uh, 48 years old when he died of cancer. Yeah, like a year after I, I went there to work for him, he ended up getting cancer. So he, he ended up closing the doors, so I, I still had my old truck. So I went back into my old truck. The audio is not the best there, but what Massett was saying was he turned right back to the old 1978 Mac, which would then provide the owner-operator a lesson he didn't soon forget. I was in pretty bad shape. Mm-hmm. And when you're you know 18 years old, you don't care about a loose bolt. Ah, there's a bunch more there. Don't worry about it, you know? <laughs> so so it, it came back and it bit me hard. Ended up having a crack frame on it. So I took uh, two weeks off and ended up uh, stripping the whole back of the frame from the cab back, all new cross members, slid two frame rails in, double frame the whole back half, roll it all out by hand, put it all back together. It was great. I, I drove it for about six months after that. And um, we had a big job in the city. And uh, I did I did really, really well, made a good chunk of money, and everything was paid off. I had money in the bank, and I told my dad, I said, Dad, I'm going to buy a new truck. He says, go ahead. You, you learned it, you know. I always liked Marmon. I just had a thing for him back then, even as a kid. So I went and looked at a new Marmon, talked to the dealer there in Chicago, Marmon. Got one set up to the bank. A friend of mine was working for a sewer company. He had a, he had a real nice Mac. He was I always told him, I said, if that truck ever came up for sale, I'd buy it. The day the bank gave me the approval, he called me to tell him the truck and trailer were for sale. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat back and I talked to my dad. And we we agreed that it would be a better deal if I bought that truck instead of a brand new truck. Because then I would have a good trailer, too, instead of the old raggedy trailer I had. Mm. So I bought that truck, 91 uh, Mongoose. And this was in um, fall of 93. What your model did you say the truck was? 89. 89, okay. It was a four, four-year-old truck and a two-year-old trailer. Had 100,000 miles on it. It was well-maintained, real good shape. Yeah. So I bought it in October. I drove it, and I come in one morning, and it's gone. So somebody somebody stole the tractor. They left me the trailer, at least, but they stole the tractor. Never did find it. So I went back to the bank. I says, would you give me a loan for a new truck? You know, again, now. So they says, yeah, we'll do it. So I went back to Marmon, and the truck that I wanted was gone. So they didn't have anything that would work for me. So I ended up buying an international. Told Dad, I'm going to pay this off. Spec out a brand new Marmon. And um, about two months before I was ready to do that, I opened up the pages of Overdrive Magazine, and Marmon Motor Company was closing their doors. Oh, so <laughs> I ended up sticking to another year and a half with my truck. Got it all paid off, and... and a good chunk of money in the bank, and then I specked out a new international. So I went 15 years, 16 years like that, and uh, I told my wife I needed a toy. I said, all my friends have motorcycles and snowmobiles and boats and all this fun stuff, and all I do is go to work. So I says, uh, she says, well, what do you want? I says, well, I says, and I wouldn't, I didn't answer at first. Said, you want to get motorcycles? I'm like, no, no, I don't want motorcycles. Well, what do you want? And I said, well, I want to buy another truck. She goes, oh, you're a, well, A blank. <laughs> I can't say the rest. I said, well, I said, and I explained it to her. I says, you know, I, said, I don't care if I ever drive it again. I said, I just want it, put it in my garage, and I'll sit on it. And I'll just tinker with it, and take it to truck shows and stuff, you know. So, so she let me buy it. And just what was it in this case? That Marmon he'd always wanted. 1989 model in this case, purchased in 2014. Let me let me back up a little bit. New International that I spec out. It was going on uh, five years old. It was 2004. So I went to the Louisville Truck Show. I kept hearing on uh, a couple different radio shows I listened to at the time. I kept hearing about this EGR 
and emissions and all the stuff on these new motors. So I wanted to see what it was about. You know, I didn't know anything about it. So I, I went to the Caterpillar this way and I found an engineer there and I says, yeah, I says, can you explain it to me? And I said, I just want to know what it's about before I go getting involved in buying it. He says, sure, he comes over, he shows me, shows me a new EGR motor. And he says, well, it's just a turbo pipe around the other side and back into the motor. And I said, is there any questions? I says, yeah, I got two. He says, um, I said, what happens if I blow the first turbo? What happens to the second turbo? He says, well, you usually blow that one too. <laughs> I said, okay, so you just doubled my cost of a repair. That's not cool. I said, so where's the filter? And he says, filter for what? I says, filter for all the dirty air that's coming up into a clean motor. He goes, yeah, there is none. There is none. I said, okay. I said, really? He said, yep. Turned around, looked at my wife. I said, don't worry, honey. I'm done buying new trucks. I built a big garage. <laughs> so now go. I got my garage. I got it set up where I can do a lot of things myself. I take care of my own truck. I maintain it. I grease it. I, I maintain, um, even now, 10,000 miles oil change. I've never had an oil-related problem um, in 30 years, 35 years of driving. Yeah. And, and owning um, it gets greased every other year, every other week, rather. Every every two weeks, it gets greased, every part. When I sold my International in 2016, it had a million plus miles on it. Still had all six original slack adjusters on it, and they still worked. Wow. So there, there's a testament to maintaining your vehicle. Owner operator Massett puts less emphasis on what he makes with his truck, rather, what he doesn't spend on it, he said. That mindset serves him well now that he's actually in business running the old 1989 Marmon full-time. That's right. It became a little more than a toy, eventually. He put it into service now some years back. But having, having an older truck and having my garage, I try to make it where I can work the week without a problem. And then yeah. uh, Saturdays are, it's time to get, get dirty and <laughs> turn around kids and do what you got to do. But... Make sure everything's up to snuff. So come Monday, you're going back to work again. You only have five days to make your money. Yeah. You know, and then Saturday and Sunday, you, you got to take a day off for the Lord. Take your Saturday to, to get what you need to get done. And it's worked good for me over the years. Steve Massett, headquartered around Chicago, spent decades hauling in the construction industry in and around the city before migrating to where he is today, over the road. With construction in Chicago, you work about nine months three months where you're kind of laying around. So I always found a company to work for in the winter, keep me busy or as busy as I want to be, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up with this company that they're the town over. So they're nice and close. And uh, they've, they've worked out wonderful for me. I, I would uh, recommend them to anybody in this area that would, doesn't, you know, that wants to make money. Yeah. And that's, and then, that's T-Max. Yes, sir. A lot of their guys, they, they end up buying the truck for them and do a police purchase deal with them. Okay. There's a couple of guys like me that own their own truck and stuff. And um, most almost all the loads are already preloaded on their trailers. So I don't even need to have a trailer. Anymore. So you go to their shipper. we got three or four different shippers and they're close. You know, I'm, I'm like right in the middle of all of them. So it makes okay. that real nice for me. So you go pick up your load. You got some that's like LTL freight. You drive to St. Louis and have four or five stops, pick up a backhaul and head home. Yeah. Uh, other stuff, it's it's a one load, unload, pick up a load, come back. Um, all of it's okay. all no, no touch freight. Um, you know they settle they settle every week. Uh, it was kind of funny when I first started working for them. Um, it was like a month in, and, and the dispatcher calls me. She says, uh, "Are you independent with wealthy?" I says, "Well." <laughs> No, why? <laughs> we just can't understand. You got four checks in the box here, and you haven't picked any of them up. And I was so, so used to with construction, you, you wait thirty days for your money. Oh, so yeah. I can't even think about looking for a check. You know, and, <laughs> yeah, there's four checks in the box with your name on them. I'm wondering why you're not picking them up. I didn't know they were there. And I said, believe me, I'll pick them up. So, so that was kind of nice to use to that, where it's it's a steady every week you're getting paid. Just. You drop your paperwork on Monday or even Tuesday morning, and by Friday you got a paycheck. Their rates are really good. If they're they're a small company, they got about eleven trucks total. Mm -hmm. uh, they take great care of me. I I wouldn't dream of going anywhere else. 
I, I've got my own company, so they pay okay. my company, and then I pay myself a salary out of that. Your, your wife's involved in the business too. Is she um, on the driving she does side? All the people, she... Without without a good woman by your side, it's a hard business to deal with. It really, <laughs> really is. And if you're going to try to work hard and make a lot of money, or make any money, and not have someone to help you with the books or things, um, it's 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 tough to do it all on your own. It really is. She yeah. is she is my uh, godsend and savior. So she manages the the paperwork side of stuff for the most part. Right, right. Uh, our checks are automatically deposited. So you know, Friday she she'll write the checks from the company back to for our salaries and pay the bills and and do all that. She does all the IFTA for me, license plates, all that stuff we do ourselves. So she okay. she takes care of all that, makes sure it's all done. Insurance, working with comp, all that stuff is taken care of with her. Um, if any time I need a, uh, a part or something like that, and I'm going to be coming home late or something, she, she'll go to Peterbilt or wherever and pick up a part for me, uh, and have it for me waiting here. So it saves me some time. I'm kind of regional, uh, okay. like Monday, I'm going to Carrollton, Kentucky, which is okay. a five hour drive. Uh, we do a lot of St. Louis, Cincinnati a little bit. Michigan, a little bit of everything. There's there's some longer stuff. We go to Kansas City, get some longer stuff. I try not to do it. I I don't like the longer stuff. I'd rather get somewhere where I can get home the same day. Right. You know, go out five hours out, five hours back. That that worked good for me. Overdrive news editor Matt Cole and his talk with Massey then asked him to elaborate on the story of just how he came to own that classic 1989 Marmon. Massey was happy to oblige. Well, I, I, I bought it in 2014. I was uh, sitting there and uh, I was working for the construction company, didn't have to use my own truck. So I had my truck plated and insured. When they laid me off, I'd go to work at EMAC for the winter. But then come spring, when they called me back, I'd park it and, and go. So I finally got to the point where I said, you know what? Construction anymore. So let's sell the trailer. So I talked the wife into letting me sell the trailer and take it to buy the Marvin. And of course, she got half the money. She got half the money for her in the house, and then I got the right. other half to buy my mom. <laughs> so that's how that worked out. You know, we had, a, we had to grease the skids a little bit. You know? That's right. <laughs> so, so I did that. I bought it, drove it back from Alabama, never really intending to, to run it. I, I thought I would buy it and just take it to the antique show, clothes and, you know, spend a little time fiddling with it and, and fixing things up and making it nice. Um, so when I brought it, I drove it home and I was like, you know, this ain't so bad after all. <laughs> I said, all right, this is this is something doable. So I got back. I started work. I spent about two years fixing most of the major stuff, changing belts, changing, hose, changing all the hooks, hairlines, all that stuff. Everything I could, every, anything rubber that I knew would be rotted or dry rotted. Or, I immediately put automatic slacks on the whole truck. I put new brakes, new shoes. I had rebuilt the roof suspension, the hangers were over. Put all the hangers on the back. Uh, started running it in 2016. Sold my international, started running that one. And um, kind of never looked back, really. Yeah, I had it, I had it paint, I painted it in my garage. It's not the greatest paint job. It's got that 50 yard, uh, you know, looks good from 50 yards away. There you so, go. All right. It, and uh, how many miles on it did it have uh, when you bought it? Uh, I know it's got over three million on it now. Okay. So I put uh, I put about six hundred thousand on the last four years. So I, I want to say probably had a little. It, I want to say it was right at two million when I bought it. I'm gonna didn't work for a little while there too, so that was something I had to take care of and fix. <laughs> but uh, it's not sitting around too much. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's going. Run maintenance, my yearly maintenance, except for any major problem I might have. My yearly maintenance is between twelve and twenty grand a year on repairs and stuff. And of course that's not counting my time. Right. That's right. parts prices and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. So but yeah, it's it, and it and it's very close to what I spent on my when I had my dump and my other truck too. But then I had I had a trailer to deal with too, not just a tractor. So They're right, a extra brakes and airlines and all that stuff. Yeah, and tires, eight more tires, and yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's 
a little more expensive to run this truck. I know that, but I, I don't have any emissions problems. I see that constantly with, with the newer trucks and, and our other 10 guys that got newer trucks. I see it constantly. They're in the shop for a sensor or for this, and then it shut down. And it just, it never made sense to me. It never did. From the time I looked at that EGR motor, Mm-hmm. And so I'm dumping the exhaust into the clean motor. This doesn't make any sense. This is ridiculous. How's that motor going to last when you're when you're pouring garbage in it? You know, mm-hmm. and and it it seems to be the way it is because they they're not lasting. They're not getting the mileage out of them like they used to, or, or the work without having to repair them. And, and now with, after COVID, everything's just so crazy. And you, you take yeah. it off to a dealer. It's like, well, we'll get to it in a month. Well, <laughs> right. How do you pay that payment for the next month when it's sitting in the garage doing nothing? You know, you're not making any money. I, I just never understood the, the reality of how that's worth it. It's right. nice to have a new truck. I've had two, two brand new trucks in my life. And yeah, it's nice to have a brand new truck. I says, but when, when you got that much stuff stacked against you, I'll I'll take my old truck any day, and <laughs> I know what I got. You know, if I, I blow a hose, I walk to the hardware store and buy a hose and put it on. Not all well, this special made hose and this special O ring and this special fit, fitting, and it just doesn't make any sense. You you buy a two hundred thousand dollar truck and they put a plastic elbow on the back of the block. When it breaks and you lose all your antifreeze, you're stuck on the side of the road. Now what do you do? You know? Yeah. Right. Whereas if, if that were me, it'd be a, a metal elbow and a hose. If the hose break, you go buy a new hose, you throw it on, you walk to the, you walk to Menards or wherever to buy a piece of hose, and you put it on, <laughs> look under your sleeper and your pile of hoses you got, and you keep it with you, and there you go. You know, you're back in business. That's one thing I do do. I try to carry, like all my belts, all my hoses, intake hoses, the. The turbo hoses, all that stuff, I got extra ones I keep in a box underneath the sleeper. And I, I hopefully I never use it, but right. patients where something breaks, and you're like, okay, let me go dig for it. I know it's there somewhere. Right. Go dig for it, you pull it out, you put it back together, and you're back on the road. You know, you're not calling for a service call at, you know, $500, you're throwing away to have someone bring you a $10 part. The rig's powered by a four and a quarter B model cat and big fuel tanks to come in handy for sizable purchases in lower priced locales when variability at the pump is high. Maintenance wise, as noted previously, oil's changed every 10,000 miles, greased every two weeks. You run it and you grease it and you, you really don't have too many problems. Yeah. Uh, you know, I try to change the antifreeze, maybe get the lifetime antifreeze, but I still try to change it. Whether it's because I blew a hose or whether it's because uh, it's changed in the water pump or whatever, I'll, you know, if I drain it out, I won't put it back in unless it's less than two years old. I'll yeah. put new stuff in. Uh, I change batteries every three years, whether they need it or not. So I only run three batteries, but okay. I I don't I don't trust them after that, and I don't idle. I try not to idle at all, even in the winter. I'll shut the truck off. For a long time, I didn't even have, I got a little bump now, but for a long time, I didn't even have that. And I just have a couple, couple snowmobile blankets and, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, wake up blue and could hardly walk. Or hardly yeah, those, those Midwest winters can get pretty rough. Yeah. I, if it's under five, if it's above five degrees, I'll shut the truck off. So once it gets down below five, then I'll probably leave it run. And kick up the, I never leave it just idle. I'll kick up the idle a little bit to get the oil pressure up. Try to save the motor a little bit of wear. I don't know. People say I'm crazy for doing it, but <laughs> I'm not going to let it just sit there and idle. I have air conditioning, but I never use it. <laughs> yeah. Well, crazy or not, if the, uh, you know, you're still on the original engine in that truck. So I think, uh, I think it's paying off somehow. Massive degrees. The unit's been through a rebuild in the past for sure, but the cat remains original. Here's a big thanks to him, our August Trucker of the Month, for walking us through the basics of his history. Matt Cole's feature about him published about a week and a half back at overdriveonline.com. He does share more about how he beat the odds after a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis when he was a very young man and essentially qualified him for a lifetime disability. However, he's continued to work and he's lived with the sometimes debilitating condition ever since. And on top of everything involved in managing the day-to-day of his trucking business, he manages that too. I'll post a link to Cole's story in the show notes wherever you're listening. 
Overdrive Radio is on Apple and Google Podcasts, SoundCloud and Spotify, Overcast.fm, and many, many others, including the world-famous OverdriveOnline.com slash Overdrive hyphen radio, where you'll find the full collection. And here's a big thanks for listening. Any feedbacks or tips for me directly? Use our podcast message line at 615-852-8530. Always love to hear from you. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support of trucker songwriter Long Haul Paul Marhofer. The theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Marhofer, featuring the guitar work of Travis the Snake Man himself, Lambic. Terry Two Socks Richardson on bass, keys by Dishamingo, Jim Whitehead, and on drums, Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive's own news editor, Matt Cole. Social media coordinator Holly Young, executive editor Alex Lockie, and video editors Lawson Rudisil and Andrew Glenn. Keep growing.